Welcome, everybody, to AM Byte. Welcome to your life. There's no turning back. And for those of you watching on video, that is a, a cool summary of Gnosticism leading to the Virtual Alexandria Academy. There is a special this month for 20% off. And of course, it does include the entire replay of Meet the Archons on the show notes. But other than that, yes, welcome. Welcome to this age of Hermes, this Philip K. Dick world and these Gnostic times. And happy Friday the 13th. What a powerful day it seems in this world that is going mad. Friday the 13th, October is when the Knights Templar were betrayed. But also today is the anniversary of the Fatima miracle of the sun. Was it an alien spaceship? Did the sun move? Well, I know somebody who was born in Portugal, my mother knew hundreds of individuals who were there, and what they saw was beyond this world. So, but that's why we're here, because we love this exciting stuff, and we know that the conventional narrative of the Archons and their Karens and Katamites in the establishment is 99% false. So today we've got a great show and very excited to deal with two amazing individuals that have more parallels than you can think, and that is Hermes and Jesus. With us to discuss this is Simon from the Library of Gnosis. Simon, thank you very much for coming on AM Byte. Greetings. It's a pleasure. Pleasure is all mine. Pleasure is exactly. all ours. <laughs> It's actually, I actually have you to thank for uh, starting my channel. You, mm -hmm. you're, my, you're my introduction into Gnosticism. Oh, well, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, uh, it'll be on the show notes, but check out Simon's channel. He's got some good videos, short form, long form. He takes you on the journey, great visuals, and uh, a lot of them are very popular. Some of your vid videos have between twenty to 40,000 views. So you are reaching people and glad you're doing it, Simon. And with us, too, we've got the man himself, Graham. Graham Pong, how are you doing today on this Friday the 13th? Pretty good, Miguel. Always great to be back at the uh, Library of Alexandria, and I'm, I'm working off some of my overdue book fees at the moment. So. <laughs> I'm thinking of the Seinfeld uh, episode. Yeah, with the cops going to find you. Uh, a classic. Well, good to see you here, too. Definitely. Yes, for those of you wondering... Vance had some commitments, so he couldn't make it. And Graham will also join us on Monday. Monday, we are very excited to have Saul Luckman. He will be discussing his new book, The World, Cult, and You. And you know what it's going to be about. Cults, mass formation, brainwashing, simulation, all that good stuff. Saul's new book is amazing and just in time, considering everything that's going on in the world and in our society right now, and really for the past two years. So that's a little housekeeping. Well, before we get started on those two cats, Simon, uh, I'm very honored that my uh, my little podcast helped you, but tell us a little bit about yourself. Have you always been interested in the esoterica, or what was your journey like? No, uh, I haven't always been interested in the esoterica. It it started. I think it started with your uh, podcast. If I'm honest, mm -hmm. I, I I I I've always been a deep thinker, but I never really got into the esoteric. I'm, I'm I mean I'm only 27, so I started quite young. Yeah, I was a brainwashed Roman Catholic back then at your age. So good. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you took you those picked... red pills. <laughs> You picked quite the date to be interviewing a uh, nice Templar. Oh, wow. Thanks. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to have a lot of magic today. Yes. The Knights Templars are nodding from whatever parallel dimension they are. Because uh, so very cool. Very cool. So awesome. Uh, well, why don't we just start with the main event and then go down the line with some other topics that you've researched so well. Most people who have an understanding of the esoteric, I would say, even people who are orthodox, uh, more open-minded uh, from the Abrahamic faith would say, yes, I mean, 
Hermes and Jesus are both logos. They're the reason of God that came into this world to enlighten man. Perhaps they sustain reality itself. Uh, so there are parallels, and the church fathers, of course, noticed them and so forth. So that's not a big deal. But what are the other similarities between Jesus and Hermes? Sure. I think first we have to start with the basics, like how I got into this. Okay, and sure, yeah. that would be the, uh, let me put on screen share. Oh, you go. Share screen. Uh, let me know. Yeah. Yeah. StreamYard's window. always a little bit strange. Yeah. You got to do present entire, entire window or you can do tab. Yeah. There you go. Now I will add you and there you go. Now we see your desktop. Perfect. All right. So what are we looking at here? Yeah. Describe it for those listening on audio. Oh, wow. This, this is uh, some Rosicrucian art. <laughs> yeah, I lot. don't, I don't know. I don't know much more about it than that. All right. It's... Well then keep going. Yeah, so the Rosicrucians believe in the Prisca Theologia. I'm sure you've heard of it, but for those who haven't, it's it translates as the ancient theology. And it's that all religions come from a primordial source of the perfect theology, or, or a true theology, you would say. And it's been diluted as the years have passed. So all it's always the oldest uh, religions that are the most correct. Makes and sense. that would make sense, right? Yeah. And that would get that gets us into the Bible. So I have a select Bible quote here. I'm sure, sure most of you have heard of it, but I'll just go with it. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? That's from Exodus 15:11. So. In, in the Bible, there are actually many gods mentioned, but they, when, when uh, the church, I think, I don't know if it was the Catholic Church, I don't, I, I'm not sure when uh, Christianity or Judaism became monotheistic, but it used to be, uh, it used to be polytheistic. That's for sure. Yes. And uh, so I believe I believe the the God, the Bible, the Bible speaks of of many different gods. The Sumerians called these beings the Anunnaki, uh, the Greek. And so on. And so it's, it's all the, the same archetypes showing up in very, diff very different religions. It's like a core to truth the core of truth within them all and one of my favorite gods who i think i think we share this is of course tov mm -hmm. he it was said to have been in i mean there's many different stories many different uh, mythologies within egyptian mythology but he was said to have been the creator deity in some of the stories and he was said to have created himself through the power of language, uh, which reminds us of the logos or Jesus. Uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word was his God, and the word was God. And he, he Toph was said to be the voice of Ra, which is also a connection there with the logos. Mm -hmm. Then we have a different character. Uh, this this archetype or a character. I don't know if it's if it's just an archetype or if it's it's actually a real being who either reincarnates or just goes by different names. But we have Enoch as well being connected to uh, Tal, Hermes, Mercurius, all of those. Mm -hmm. I'm, yeah. I, I think we've spoken about this before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, certainly, I don't know, it's Philo of Alexandria, Josephus, probably Philo did it. Other Jewish thinkers did it, obviously. Uh, the Muslims, to the Muslim mystics, Thoth or Hermes was Enoch. There was no, it was not a big deal. It was pretty mainstream. So, yeah. Yes. 
One Enoch, book of parables, presents two figures, the Son of Man and Enoch. At first, these two characters seem to be separate entities. Enoch views the Son of Man enthroned in heaven. Later, however, they prove to be one and the same. And Enoch, of course, was, uh, was one of the few characters in the Bible who entered heaven alive, where he was... Uh, is it apotheosis when you become yeah. like a god? Yeah, yeah. That's it. he That's was it. turned into the angel of Metatron, and Metatron was known to be the closest soul to God. I mean, if you ask a Christian today who the closest soul to God is, they would, of course, say, Jesus, Jesus, right, right. <laughs> Uh, one of one of his names uh, of Enoch was actually the the lesser Yahweh. So uh, there's a lot of connections there. Then we have my favorite uh, favorite version of the pantheon, which is Hermes, of course. Mm -hmm. Here we see a a statue of Hermes carrying a ram, the ram bearer. Uh, one of his titles was Hermes Kriopouros, which means the, the ram bearer or the good shepherd. And what I find is so interesting is that I'm pretty sure the New Testament was written in Cohen Greek. Am I wrong? No, you're right. And Originally, if it yeah. was written in Greek, they must have seen the connection between the good shepherd and Hermes. They must have, they must have known about it for sure. But they still included that. Which is, I think, weighs pretty heavily that they're the same character. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Hermes' mother being Maya, uh, an earth nymph. And Jesus', Jesus uh, mother was Maria. There's one letter difference. Funny how that works out sometimes. Uh, Hermes was, of course, born of an earthly mother and the heavenly father. Just like Jesus. Um, let's see. We have Hermes Cadesius uh, signifying his role as a healer. This is, of course, reflected in Christ as well. Uh, both are uh, masters of rhetoric. Uh, using, I mean, he's literally called the logo, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Let's see what more we got. Hermes, uh, Hermes, much like Abraxas, is a god of liminality, a god of balance. I would say he's the S, silver lining in the yin and the yang. It's, uh, it's very interesting, the connection between Abraxas and Hermes. They are very similar. They're, they're like the same archetype. Yeah, please expand on that one. I'm always, you know, I'm always ready to listen, listen as much as I can about Abraxas. <laughs> <laughs> so this gets us into the squaring of the circle, which I, the connection I found at least. The, the for those who haven't heard of it before, it's surprisingly unknown. Uh, I, I mean, I do. I listen to a lot of podcasts and a lot of YouTube videos. So on. it's not often mentioned. Maybe I'm looking in the wrong places, but for so being such an important uh, subject, it's very rarely mentioned. Anyways, the problem of squaring the circle is the problem of creating a square with the same area as a given circle. But it's proven to be impossible because to calculate pi, calculate a circle, you use... Uh, Radius times pi squared, I think, if I remember correctly. And pi is a transcendental number, meaning that it's infinite. So you, you would be, it would be impossible to create a circle or a square with the same area as a circle. And the squaring of the circle, it represents, like in the Bible, in Genesis 1, you have, uh, let me see, 
In the beginning, God created the heavens, circle, and the earth, square. So it's always it's, it's written in the first sentence of the Bible. It's squaring the circle. It's it describes the nature of God. Uh, it's doing the impossible. It's the creator who creates himself. That's squaring the circle. And we find this with uh, Jesus as well, having uh, an unearthly mother and a fatherly, uh, heavenly father, of course, doing the impossible, being both human and God at the same time. Yes. We also find uh, the squaring of the circle. This is something I think more people know about it now, but the square and compass in Freemasonry, that's supposed to represent the, the squaring of the circle, of course, as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the 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 serpent in the Garden of Eden is in a lot of Gnostic texts was said to be to be Jesus, of course. And in alchemy, we find we find that the, the symbol of the serpent represents Mercury. So it might have been Mercury who was the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Now I think that humans used to have this blissful innocence to them like walt whitman always envied animals because they don't lie awake at night weeping for their sins mm -hmm. animals are very practical and they're of course not afraid of being naked what's what's your opinion on uh on on the that, that whole story what happened when they ate from the forbidden tree well <clears throat> Obviously, as uh, leaning into the Gnostic worldview in many of their Gospels, uh, Adam and Eve were trapped in a prison, and uh, the fruit was Gnosis. It was them waking up to the reality of who they were. Now, obviously, there's variations in text. Some, you know, the, the Demiurge is completely evil. He's using Adam and Eve to feed off of their essence. The Garden of Evil is just a, it's just a dark evil simul sim simulacrum uh, in others it's maybe a little bit more benign especially when you get into i don't know the kabbalah and martinist theology and some others it's it's you know it's more ambiguous but yes uh you might say the fruit is the beginning of uh, understanding of the self and the serpent is seen in many gnostic texts in the manichaean as a revealer some say he was jesus some say he was sophia um the secret book of john has a different view it's just the serpent's actually evil the demiurge but there's this eagle and i know you use this eagle symbolism that falls on the tree and helps adam and eve and the eagle is actually jesus so that's pretty much in oh, that's short super to take. Interesting. yeah because i know in your videos you talk about the symbolism of the eagle i was just about to get into that oh like cool. you fly here um, I believe there there are two characters, two uh, counteracting forces in the Garden of Eden. The it's Yahweh and the serpent, of course. I believe that there's a connection between Yahweh, who in the uh, no, let's just go with Enlil, Enlil and Yahweh. Enlil was, of course, the supreme god in the divine council, the supreme hierarch. We find this with Yahweh, of course, and his divine counsel. And the eagle, of course, was the symbol of Enlil. Um, I haven't I haven't quite found that connection yet with Yahweh. But another connection is that Enlil was a storm and warrior deity. Whereas this in the oldest scriptures we have of uh, Yahweh, oldest texts, describe them as a war and storm deity so we find a connection there too both were also said to sit on the great mountain and we find this with i have uh an image here of this is supposed to be yahweh and 
Um, I think if you can see, he's holding a bird. I do wonder if that's an eagle. Might be. And when I download, I downloaded this image off Wikipedia. It's titled Zeus Yahweh, which mm. interesting, very interesting. Definitely, you definitely have this prototype again. Like you said, the storm god and include Baal, Marduk, and others. So many of these <clears throat> that became personalized, tweaked, marketed depending on the tribe, right, or the region of the land. Yeah, for sure. But this god, Enlil or Marduk or Yahweh, they were storm gods, but they were also gods of order, weren't they? I mean, they were. That's why they were attractive. They were male-centric, control power gods, weren't they? Yes. Uh, like we have uh, Thor's Day, Thursday, is the day of Jupiter mm -hmm. right. as well. So a lot of people like to think that Enlil or Yahweh is evil. Some, some even think he's the devil. But I, I don't hold to that belief. I believe they're uh, gods of order, but they're 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 harsh order, like uh, di disciplinary order, not uh, you know. Not so they could uh, be like Saturn. They're they're about boundaries and keeping things kosher and organized and all that, which is fine unless it goes too far, right? <laughs> we right in a mechanistic universe in society <laughs> no chaos yeah. no adventure no imagination oh wait it's 2023 here we are <laughs> universe mechanistic <laughs> universe of order <laughs> yes uh i think that there that we our, our evolution in, in the Garden of Eden came with a great uh, drawback or great suffering. Mm -hmm. it, when we became lost from the animal mind, when, when we evolved from the animal mind to the human mind, that was the introduction of sin because we could, uh, animals don't have moral reasoning. So that was a fall. That it was a fall at the same time as an evolution. I have a video. It's titled uh, "the F The Fall of Man Was a Painful Evolution." So I guess the question is, how do? What is the end game, uh, Simon? Are we evolving to as uh, some would like as the those in the Gospel of Thomas says to get back in the garden, lift the veil, or what? Where are we supposed to be evolving to to escape? As you say in your video, Samsara. <laughs> yeah I, I it does say in the scriptures like they have become like like one of us so i think what the serpent did was g giving us the opportunity for apotheosis becoming like the gods we this is already shared by the mystery schools like, for instance, the Golden Dawn is all about transcending your humanity, pretty much, becoming a god on Earth. It's kind of Luciferian when you think about it. <laughs> yeah, hidden in plain sight. And that, yeah, that's not that radical. I mean, in some Kabbalistic schools, uh, Adam and Eve had a choice to go down and restore the universe, but Godhood was on the other side. Even in Greek Orthodoxy, the sin was that uh, they were too fast. They were meant to be like uh, the Elohim, but Adam and Eve kind of, they jumped the gun. There, there was there was supposed to be more training in the Eden. <laughs> more of, but, so they were so fast, God was like, well, now you got to get out, but... Again, there's a million interpretations. There's something very powerful archetypically about the Garden of Eden. Bliss, childhood, uh, the unconscious, unity. So uh, it's, a, it's a very powerful story that, of course, appears in so many legends and myths, even beyond the Middle East and that area. Yeah, I think... 
spoken of uh, different ages. Uh, the first one was known as the Golden Age. And I believe uh, I believe every apotheosis was a lot easier back then. I believe we had uh, more powers of powers of the mind like telekinesis, telepathy, so on and so forth. And I think the uh, the Kali Yuga we're currently in, I've heard from a Templar brother that it's ending 2025. So big things are coming if he's correct. Yeah, the problem I have with that is that in some tra Hindu traditions, uh, the, the the time between two ages can be like a million years. So it's not like we're going to enjoy the next, even, <laughs> you know, the age of Aquarius takes forever. It's not like one day it happens. It's, so uh, in our next, in one of our future incarnations, we'll enjoy the next day. <laughs> I, yeah. I hope I'm not coming back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you might, because remember, I mean, the, the Gnostics were a Christian body shot fuss. They believed, hey, if you're awake and you can help somebody, you stick around. Sorry. You know, we need we need help. We need soldiers down here. So you might be around, Simon, for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Service to others, of course. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Always. Without that, it's uh, it's not Gnosis, as I say. So uh, what do you think, Graham? Do you have a question or what do you think of all of this? No, I was going to say fascinating stuff. I did have a few questions there sure, sure. Is um, for Simon. One of them is what were his thoughts on going instead of uh, going to the east from uh, Egypt, about his thoughts about the parallels between Hermes and Naboo and even going on into Hindu with uh, Pushan. And uh, my take on the whole Garden of Eden is, it, you know, that that's getting consciousness. Ignorance is bliss. And when you can tell the difference between good and evil, you know, now, now you know things are bad if they happen to be. And, uh, oh, sorry. I'm, the other note on, on a god is uh, connections between Hermes and potentially uh, Janus of the, uh, of the Romans. And last one, thoughts on the Caduceus and the symbolism of the snake and the bird being combined into his staff. Whole bunch there, Simon. Sorry. <laughs> I've been saving up. Tag. <laughs> um, well, you st first one stumped me because I'm I haven't researched uh, Eastern uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodoxy is Eastern religions that much. I'm a bit familiar with Hinduism. I like Taoism a lot. It's pro Taoism is probably my favorite religion, if I'm honest. It's, yeah, it's, it's can you even call it a religion? It's, well, you can't call, <laughs> it's a way Gnosticism is not a religion. It's a it's like shamanism. It's a spiritual modality that you can Taoism is the same way. And I love Taoism and Gnosticism have a lot of parallels. My favorite one is that they are intrinsically anarchist. They are they are against order, if you know what I mean. They are part of the chaos brigade. <laughs> Yes, but. and uh, I'm not too familiar with Janus. Is that the, the two-faced god, is he called that? Exactly. Yeah, and also the god yeah. of uh, doorways and such, which that, that becomes a lot of uh, parallels uh, to Hermes. That's Hermes, yeah. Yeah, and uh, of course Hermes was always depicted as uh, either a wise old man or a baby or a young man. He was always transcending time itself. He is a god of time as well, uh, told and yeah. That's interesting because uh, in the secret book of John, in the beginning, Jesus appears to the apostle John in all the shapes. He's an old man. He's a child. He's a woman. He basically says, I am everything. And then, then he appears like the hippie and they have a conversation. They do it. So. <laughs> but for, uh, uh, and uh, go ahead. What was what was the last question? My memory is pretty short. Before that, Grandma, what would you say would be a Hermes equivalent in India? I there's a goddess for you guys called Matangi. She's a female goddess, but she is blow by blow Hermes in the West. I mean, again, the Hindus have like a million gods, but she's amazing. In fact, I, I just I haven't had the money. I want to buy some iconography. So, I mean, I've got uh, Ganesha back here, but I want to buy Matangi because she's an amazing uh, trickster, female logos. 
and it's hard to find female logos in any mythology. But who would you say, Graham, is Hermes in the Hindu dispensation? Um, I was going to say on the goddess side, Saraswati, with mm. uh, you know the patron of the arts, creation of writing, you know all of that. You know has a certain Hermes split kind of between Hermes and uh, and Apollo. And the other one is uh, Pushan, who was, you know, much, without the, the whole concept of writing some of the thought area, but much more of the god of merchants, god of travelers, god of doorways and borders sort of thing. So it seems like, you know, they have two different, you know, a god and a goddess, each with different aspects that, that were attributed to Hermes' portfolio in the West. Yeah. Sometimes I, Krishna could be, right? He's a, do a god of the crossroads. He's a trickster. He just he's just a supreme being and kind of a cool guy <laughs> oh yeah no no krishna the parallels between krishna and jesus are very very strong so and uh oh the last question i had was on the caduceus with the, yeah, uh, the snake and uh snake and bird uh combined into uh the the staff for hermes okay i mean when i look at the the staff of uh, the caduceus it strikes me to have ha having a very similar uh, structure as the structure of DNA. For sure. <laughs> Other than that, uh, I'm guessing, I'm guessing it has to do with uh, the Kundalini energy, maybe the spine in the middle. Now you have the pineal gland being the dot, and the wings being the transcendence, higher uh, consciousness. It's just a guess, I'm guessing. No, Maybe. that's a good guess. That's one of the, the common ones that I've heard. And that's why yeah. when you see the twinings around the rod, it's usually, you, you usually you'll see seven turnings, thereby corresponding also to the seven, uh, seven chakras. Hey. Right. Oh, I good. almost forgot to mention uh, Jesus, another connection we have with Hermes and Jesus. Oh. Uh, Jesus was crucified, correct? Next to what? To two thieves. Thieves and Hermes is the god of thieves. Yeah. Thieves. There yeah. we go. Another connection. I think yeah. it symbolically links Jesus to uh, thieves. <clears throat> yeah, he was a criminal, or he was part of the rabble, if you would. And what's interesting on the Caduceus, I remember. Uh, a friend, a pagan friend said, the problem we have with American Western medicine is that hospitals do adopt the caduceus, but they shouldn't have. They should have adopted the the staff of Asclepius because that's with the one serpent and one staff. So when you're adopting the staff of Hermes, it's all great, but then you're going to get the trickster energy. You're going to get the greed, the shadow side of Hermes. The greedy merchant, the shit poster, the again, the bad sides of Hermes, which of course, as we've all seen, has really affected Western medicine. So the the medical world played with this symbol and it sort of bit him in the ass. So so if you're gonna open a doctor's <laughs> office, use Asclepius. It's just nice healing, you know, nice healing. <laughs> I think the World Health Organization uses the rod of Asclepius see see not that it's helped them but, but you know at least it's, they're, yeah, but they they're so okay. evil <laughs> they they went they went with the trickster energy for sure yeah 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 i think they went full arc on energy <laughs> didn't even waste any time <laughs> and uh what's interesting too is you're talking about uh these storm gods but the, even the one god who's a storm god but is a trickster is, of course, uh, Typhon Set of the Egyptians. So he's a little bit different, although because, again, he is very much a, a patron of the outsider, of the immigrant, of those on the margins. But he is a storm god, too. Now, there's no difference. But in ancient times, yes, the uh, a lot of the Greeks and stuff did equate Yahweh and set that's why you see iconography with yahweh with the head of a donkey in a lot you know crucified or other things because they they thought uh set and yahweh were similar even even though they weren't no i would say seth is more a uh, saturn energy you think while so? yahweh is more jupiter energy 
Mm. I think Seth is the Egyptian version of Satan. Mm. It's it means Saturn. It's it's what the uh, the elites worship. It's Saturn, and the god of lead. What are his characteristics? Discipline, wealth. Um, can't come up with all of them at the top of my head. <laughs> but the, the discipline and wealth is two of those. Yeah. Definitely. And his colors are his colors are red and black. I find it interesting that the Queen's Guard and judges always use black and red. Well, Saturn is a harsh them, judge. But... Yeah, he's a harsh judge. But yeah, it's very Franz Kafka in his judgments. <laughs> <laughs> Very fascinating. Yeah, if you, for those of you in the audience, if you have a question, please super chat them. You can do it for as less as a dollar. Uh, you know, with Vance not here and Graham is sort of back and forth, it helps separate questions so we can get to them. Um, there was somebody, who, I saw something early, which was an interesting one, going back to Abraxas, bringing in Santana's Abraxas. Now, that's an interesting point because people have to understand that in the 60s, Herman Hesse was very popular with the hippie generation. And for example, so, um, and Abraxas does appear in the in Damien in his novel, Damien, big novel. Abraxas is represented as this power of individuation and rebirth and a very positive figure. So even like the Wilson brothers of the the Beach Boys were they were Gaga over uh, Abraxas and Herman Hesse. Now somebody else who adopted Abraxas was Charles Manson. Charles Manson himself said that his patron god god was Abraxas. Now how he warped Abraxas into whatever kooky insane ideas he had. Well, we all can do that. I mean, gods are just they have an image. And this image can be warped. So in case you were wondering about uh, Abraxas and, uh, and of course, Carlos Santana, 60s, part of that vibe, you know, he was probably utilizing Herman Hesse's Abraxas or Herman Hesse's depiction of Abraxas, where Herman Hesse, who was a patient of Jung, got his first ideas of Abraxas probably. So anyway, a little um, outside. I think it was Carl Young who wrote that everything Hermes steals, he offers to the gods. So mm. he's a divine trickster. It's not just for uh, selfless pleasure. Yeah, that's true. I mean, of course, the, the primordial myth of Hermes is the idea of him stealing cattle from Apollo and the big fight that they both get into because Hermes is a baby, but he's already, you know, trickster is going to trickster. So the first thing he thinks as a baby is to steal the sun god's cattle, but then they work it out. Apollo is nice and makes him the caduceus. So the solar powers gives him the caduceus. And I think the, one of the things about the caduceus is that whoever wields it is not uh under the spell of fate or karma he is beyond even the gods have their own karma fate have to go through the cycle of the ages but hermes is the one god who is beyond any sort of fate kismet karma you name it or boundary so that's his big advantage but and of course you're talking about iconography hermes and apollo sometimes get a conflated a lot and the christians used to like you said depict jesus as this nice youth with the thing and the pagans were like that's apollo and some said oh well that's hermes so again this whole logos thing if you include apollo yeah um all the planets of course revolve around the sun the uh king of king lord of lords so uh Jesus is often correlated with the sun, but I would argue that the sun is actually his father. It represents Ra, like Ra is the father of Toth in some stories. And who, what, what is the closest planet to uh, to the sun? Mercury, of course. <laughs> yes. So he's that like the it. stepping stone towards uh, unification uh, with God. Yeah. That's yeah, above, yeah. so below, of course. 
Yeah, good point. Very good eye. Yeah. So many great connections. Uh, and uh, you also talk about Quetzalcoatl. You want to share about Quetzalcoatl, this other logos? <laughs> sure. He he was a, a vegetarian and a god of wisdom and agriculture, I think, as well. I'm not super in red about Quetzalcoatl, but it, it was said, I, this is something I learned from a Graham Hancock, we're not sure that the stories are legit, but it was said that he 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 came from the east, yes, the east, and he he was bearded and white. This leads me this leads me to believe that uh, that the gods, the uh, the Anunnaki or whatever we want to call them, that they were uh, blue eyed and white skinned. It's it's very controversial, but that's what the evidence seems to point towards. Uh, uh don't tell me they were nordics they were alien nordics <laughs> <laughs> it, it seems so i believe there's a connection as well with uh scythians mm. yeah that's for sure i was Ancient gonna stuff. say if they're if they're not blondes they're redheads one of the two yeah they're often the they're genders oh my god <laughs> <laughs> I think yes, the other hello. thing, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, you go ahead. Yeah, the interesting story about the myth of Quetzalcoatl is that he is tricked by his brother, and I can't pronounce his name. Shame on me. But his brother is a trickster god, and he, he gets, he has Quetzalcoatl get drunk. You know, these gods are always partying and they're whatever, having <laughs> spaceships, wherever the hell they are. And Quetzalcoatl embarrasses himself. I don't know, takes like naked selfies or posts, you know, drunk things on the internet. But he's so embarrassed that Quetzalcoatl leaves in shame and his brother takes over and rules the Mesoamerica, rules the Aztec. So you have this unusual thing where a trickster god is also the supreme lord of order and rules over an entire people because... Whether it's Jesus or Hermes, trickster gods are always kind of on the, they're always on, like you said, the liminal spaces. They speak to the artist, the thief, the the outcasts, if you would. They're not exactly mainstream. I know one, one uh, story where they're mainstream, which is very close to me being a Swede. Hmm. Um, Odin, of course, trickster, oh, yeah. trickster deity. And, He's been associated with Hermes. Yeah, you're right. Uh, the Romans used to call Wednesday Dies Mercury. Mm -hmm. And Wednesday, of course, Woden's Day. Yeah, you're still doing Spanish. Yeah. Miércoles means Mercury Day. But there we go. I was this gonna guy say gets... In... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Graham. I was going to say, in Norse mythology, I have trouble going 100% with Odin. Because it's so hard not to go with Loki with Mercury. It's like <laughs> each of them seem to seem to have almost equal claim to the term. Again, now you're looking at almost two sides to the same coin, where you have Odin and Loki being blood brothers and a duality going on there, and both of them being Hermes. But that that that's I think Odin is Hermes. more. But he, I think Odin's because he gives language, he gives magic to the people. You know, he's more like Thoth. He gives all these useful things to others loki is more of a you know i'm gonna change the, i'm gonna challenge the established system and move things around and yeah i caused ragnarok but i also helped you guys with so many other th you know what are you gonna do right well i was gonna say the other just to defend loki a little bit you know being loki's <laughs> advocate is most of the the good stuff the gods ended up with was because loki kind of tried to do something and screwed up on it Exactly. You know, the walls of Asgard, that's the result of Loki screwing up. You know, Thor's hammer, that was Loki's a different screw up. You know, it's like it, it's like he screws up, but the gods benefit from it. And again, that, that's very Hermes-like, where it's the experimentation and the products, you know, mistakes and the products from mistakes end up being useful. Again, like I said, it's... it's you know, Loki is, uh, you know, in the mythology, isn't necessarily evil. He's just more chaos oriented. Yeah. Exactly. It's much more in the Marvel comics that he became just more of a villain. So, tag. 
exactly yeah yeah i mean tricksters are getting beyond human morality they help you know Prom prometheus brings fire but fire will burn you but it'll also keep you warm at night so i think as humans we need that because we need to take a risk because playing it safe has not worked out <laughs> it's not working yeah. out and our society is collapsing because we want we don't embrace ambiguity. We don't embrace the chaos. We don't tap into our inner flame and artist and trickster. So um, we do need the trickster. One of my favorite versions of the trickster is the uh, coyote from uh, Indian or Native American. <laughs> I'm a dog lover myself. So a trickster dog is just perfect for me. Yeah, yeah. I see Sometimes a lot of coyotes where I live. Sometimes we need to be tricked for our own good, and that's part of it. Yeah. Trickster means change. That's what in Native American lore they call the coyote or the beaver or the, or, you know, these trickster spirits, they just call them the changer. So he came to give change, whether you like it or not. It's just necessary. So, and again, we are not, we are not changing as a species. Notice how there's no good technological advancements. Notice how our music is shit. Notice how our fashion is basically the same as it was in 2004. Notice we're just sort of stuck because we don't want to change. We don't want to bring in those trickster energies. But uh, eh, don't get me started. Uh, more. <laughs> the proof is in the Loki pudding, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Another interesting uh, thing about uh, Hermes is his placement on the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. Mm. His, he is on the left side, which is female, but he's always depicted as male. It's that duality, liminality. Oh, yeah. Where is he on the Tree of Life? Who is he, who is he associated with? Oh, uh, good question. Would it be <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think. Uh, Venus, female. Who else? Uh, I'll have to look. Yeah, I'm. I'm not super familiar with Kabbalistic. It's just something I picked up. Yeah, I want to take a look. I try not to talk about it without a cheat sheet in front of me. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. <so funny. laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, maybe I shouldn't have brought it up. <laughs> so hey, many the audience gets, connections. Yes, the audience gets to do their own research. I'm yeah, sure yeah, there I'm... are more co more connections I've missed. Um, this yeah. is still an ongoing process. It was only like uh, a year ago, maybe. Yeah, about a year ago, I figured all of this out. So still brand new to me. But once once you start seeing the connections, they they're endless. There are endless. You'll keep going and going to other cultures or new research will come or some new archaeological find will be like, whoa, this definitely uh, supports what I'm saying. And it's wonderful. And at the end of the day, it's it really is a journey of your self-discovery, Simon. You're finding about yourself more than anything at the end of the day. So, One of my favorite parts is when I find myself, I, I've reasoned myself into a dead end. And it's like, nope, that can't possibly be right backtrack and head another direction mm -hmm. it's like you at least learned so tag hey. yeah exactly or just relax a little bit and it will come to you it will be downloaded from the higher worlds but oh we have another character as well from the bible like when the bible became monotheistic all of the gods which are mentioned by name sometimes el el yon for example so on all the gods became demoted to angels instead but in i don't know if it's kabbalah or angelic magic whatever they're they're still correlated with the planets so for instance michael is ori is oriented to uh, the planet mercury so i believe that michael the, the i think it's a later day saint who also hold this view that uh, Michael is actually Jesus, another name for Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of they course do. we have that connection there with the Mer Mercury. Yeah, the Gnostics certainly saw Michael as a demiurge. I have a Michael, 
I have a Michael necklace. My mom got it for me when I was born, and I wear it because she bought it for me, but I don't like Michael. <laughs> See him as the demiurge. <laughs> but again, this is a trickster universe. The joke <laughs> is always on us. At the end of the day, it's always on us, and the answer is to change. Very simple. Change. Find a new way. So, Simon, I wanted to talk a little bit, unless you have something else to say. Who are the Archons? Who would you say the Archons are our favorite villains? How do they play into your roles? Uh, I know you're very much, uh, they're not extraterrestrials. They're not from another planet. <laughs> There's heaven, which is fine. You've taken some. But tell us, who are the Archons and how do they play? Are they the Anunnaki? Are they the Elohim? Or are they something else? Well, it depends. So let's let's start with this. All of the planets have a positive and a negative aspect. So of it's course. it's all about overcoming the, the, the fates, the planets. Those are the, the ordainers of fate. But I believe that the Archons are some kind of demonic force that emanated when the universe it, when the universe exploded, like um, the monad divided itself into like aeons. Like the, the different gods who like symbolize love, wisdom, so on and so forth, like a light to a prism, like a, a fractal. And when, when the gods were created, so the underworld was also created where demons or archons reside. So I, I, I think the the gods are like they're questionable, they're they're like positive but kind of neutral as well, <laughs> while the archons. Or something far, far darker and evil. I I can't really place them, but I do believe. Like yeah, I I listened to your uh, your interview with a doctor who said that the voices when he asked the patient who the, the voices in his head was even more psychotic than he was. I don't think it's the gods doing that. Yeah, it's some other Morgan's kind of kid. force. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there yeah, we go. Dark on mind power sucks, yeah. And would you say, uh, what do you think? Are we in a simulation, a prison, or is this simply a cosmic gymnasium? Uh, what do you think of, of, of Earth or the material realms? I think it's prison school, maybe. <laughs> <We're>... <laughs> a hard school, yeah. <laughs> a hard school, yeah, exactly. We it, it might it might be that we're trapped in samsara, as they say, and just doomed to endlessly repeat this un until we figure it out. But I would like to think that this life, like I, I am, I am a hermeticist, not a gnostic. Mm -hmm. So my view towards the world is a bit more uh, positive. I think it's, I think it's the age we live in right now that's causing all that. I mean, if you look at the world, it's so beautiful. Just like the image of it is so beautiful. You look at a beautiful woman or a sunset or a, just uh, watching a tree. It's very mm. beautiful. But because of some evil motherfuckers, can I swear? It's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> some some really evil motherfuckers that control this world. This one percent, the uh, black Venetian black nobility is what they're called. Because of them, this place has become well. Just look out the door, war, <laughs> war. What is it good for? <laughs> exactly, or the Black Sabbath, war pigs. That song should be sang by everybody right now. Like, stop this evil. Stop fighting. Stop killing children, for God's sake. It's a very simple formula. Don't kill children. Do everything in your power not to kill children. Doesn't matter what the children look like, where they are. Don't kill children. Uh, and yeah, animals too. Just don't stop. Um, it is true. Although the Corpus Hermeticum, what I like too, and most a lot of New Agey Hermeticists do is it is very dark at times, isn't it, Simon? I mean, Hermes and Asclepius, yes. they say some bad things about the body <laughs> and the universe. And I think they're being, you know, they're being honest because, yes, this is a it's a universe of beauty. 
but it has also had a lot of bad things disease death a natural uh natural disaster <clears throat> you know tragedy and uh sh and can come at any time it's a limited world there's a better world even though as Hermie said it's probably in our head too but there's a better world i think the uh the mystery schools used to teach that the world at first it was really gnostic but like the word is a prison but mm -hmm. once you've got into a a certain level of understanding you evolve into a hermetic the way of thinking from what i understand like the Knights nice templar are very gnostic and they're they use the Braxis a lot as their symbol and so on. Dedicated to Mary Magdalene, yada, yeah, yeah. The more I study them, the more I realize, ah, oh, they were definitely connected either to the Gnostics or maybe the Assassins or some other Gnostic group. They were definitely, they were rubbing shoulders with this ancient mysticism. And it might not be good. Some of it could have been very dark. Again, fire from the gods. It can enlighten you, but it's going to burn you, so... That reminds me of uh, Rorschach and Watchmen with the, uh, you know, I'm not yeah. locked in here with you. You're, You're locked, locked in, in here with me. <laughs> and that's what Gnosis puts you through in the prison planet. Hey. Love it. Love it. However, Graham, we have to admit, I mean, when I read the Watchmen, I, when I was younger, I loved uh, Rorschach because he was somebody who was, uh, he wasn't going to compromise. He was steadfast and laser filled. He saw the world in a very Manichaean way, lightness and dark, and he was a fighter. But I think Alan Moore was like, people kind of didn't realize that he's just my representation of a fascist. Isn't that what Alan Moore wanted or was trying to uh, portray? I don't know it's particularly on fascist, but yeah, he was writing Rorsch Rorschach as, as a distasteful character. He had no <laughs> idea that he was going to become a hero to people. People he love was, him. He was an example of, of what can happen if you, you know, you stare into the abyss and you snap. Exactly. Exactly. Well, again, these things are alive. These symbols are alive. So and they take on their own power. This seems to be the uh, cultural age of this superhero, considering all the movies we're getting. But if I have to be honest, they're mostly terrible movies. 90% of them yeah. are just shit. Just shit. That's Sturgeon's yeah. law. 90% of everything is shit. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and the gods, as the, we had Chris Knowles last week, the gods are simply representation. I'm sorry. The heroes, comic book heroes, are just representation of the gods or representations, archetypes, and archetypal energies. I mean, Superman was based on Hercules. Wonder Woman is diana slash um uh artemis flash hey look flash is mercury we've got him right there in the superheroes and uh so forth and so forth batman i have no idea the shadow or i don't can't think of a god he might represent it's just hades i don't know but uh these what this is what we do and if comic book superhero collapse it'll be bad for modern mythology but hopefully Somebody will be take a risk and create a new mythology. Again, think of the Matrix. That's one of our great modern mythologies. Somebody tried to do something different. I know, Graham, you're going to say they stole from uh, the Invisibles and Philip K. Dick, but you know what I mean. <laughs> the Wachowskis kind of ripped off a few genres and works themselves. <laughs> oh, I appreciate the first movie. The, 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 what came afterwards, eh, I, I think we could have been spared that, but the first one was brilliant. Yeah, it could have ended that. It would have been just fine if it ended that right there. Cool. Yes, I love The Matrix. Great yeah, movie. Ma mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. Well, great talk. Yeah, a little housekeeping. For those of you, uh, thank you very much for your support let me look at any super chats uh cyberview i really appreciate the continued support steve hill thank you i think you're the one who made that really funny joke you're wondering if this show is going to be about the new uh new luxury purse uh <laughs> called jesus from the company hermes no 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 luxury purses from you but 
Thank you for the super chat. Chester, as always, thank you for your support. It really does help keep the lights of the Pleroma on. And uh, you guys rock. Uh, anything else you want to cover, Simon? No, I think I'm good. You think we covered everything? Elohim, Anunnaki, Archons. That's quite a that's quite a feast right there. That's quite a topic. So, I all right, I, I will have this on the show notes. But for those uh, listening on audio, or you're watching on YouTube and you're ironing your clothes or whatever you're doing, uh, where can people find out more about you? You can find me at the Library of Gnosis. I am on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, BitChute, Odyssey. If I'm not on a platform, then let me know. <laughs> I sign up. So people should just type "library Simon Library of Gnosis." You'll show up in some in the search engines. Yeah, just Library of Gnosis. I'll show up for sure. All right, cool, cool. Yeah, we'll check uh, out his been... work. Go ahead. It's been a pleasure being on. I love talking to you. You're yeah, yeah, you, Graham, too. Yeah, we should do it again. Have a nice little round table and see, see what symbols and mythologies we can unpack. So, yes, and thanks for the audience there at the chat room. You didn't uh, turn the chat into Wetiko, into the Chetiko. Uh, great comments that I see from here. Uh, and again, please subscribe, share. Don't forget that on Monday we will have Saul Luckman talking about the world cult. And uh, you're going to be pretty startled because he says, well, his thesis is that we're all in a cult and we all need to unbrainwash. As, we, as long as we're in the simulation, we're in a cult and most people don't know it. But we'll get more into that. You'll enjoy it. Graham, thanks for keeping us company. And certainly look forward to uh, hanging with you on uh, Moon Day. No, no, looking forward to it. Try, looking forward to hearing about the world cult. And uh, it's always great to be here. And I need to put together another presentation for you myself. So uh, we'll yeah, talk, can't we'll wait. talk yeah. soon. Yeah, definitely. We want to talk about your ideas on the birth of Christianity, which, again, that's going to blow people people's mind away too so uh you guys ain't seen nothing yet but we do enjoy your company please enjoy the rest of your freya day it's talking about a a goddess that's pleasing on the eyes and a, a lot of power and please enjoy your weekend and as i always say yeah happy friday the 13th write your own gospel live your own myth take care everyone